So, uh, the last thing we talked about was the Middle Kingdom, and uh, that was sort of brief, the rock, the rock cut tombs, remember, and the more naturalized looking sculpture. Um, so just to kind of reiterate where we're at historically, the Hyksos come in and conquer Egypt. Um, they're there for a while. They are there, then driven out by almost the first. Um, he conquers and drives them out. Um, and then we have uh, his rule, which kind of ushers in the new kingdom. Okay, so 1570 to around 1544 uh, is the beginning of the new kingdom. And then um, it ends around 1070 BC. So it lasts longer than the Middle Kingdom. Um, the 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasties make up the new kingdom. The capital is now in Thebes, so the capital has, has relocated. And it's considered by many historians to be Egyptians' golden age. You'll hear the term golden age in this class a lot because historians love to label things as golden ages and dark ages. Okay, so now we're in, we're in what many historians consider to be Egypt's golden age. All right, so just to catch us up, we have the Old Kingdom, pyramids. That's the big thing there. We have the Middle Kingdom, cliff tombs, right? Tombs cut directly into the rock. And now we have the New Kingdom, and what is the thing we're going to see here? Temples. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So gods and goddesses were worshiped by royals at temples, and then the royals are buried there themselves. So this is a different thing than we've seen before because we have separate locations for the worship of gods and the burial of royalty. They were not uh, together, they were separate things. So that's one of the distinctive things about the new kingdom is that we have this combination of burial and worship, which is, is a, a new kind of idea. Um, which kind of makes sense because remember our kings become um, deified after death and become gods themselves. So them being buried in a place of worship kind of makes sense culturally if you think about it. So let's look at Deir el Bari. This is the complex of mortuary temples and tombs on the west bank of the Nile opposite Luxor, which we'll look at a little later. And um, this is part of the Theban uh, necropolis. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, meaning it's protected and considered one of the most important historic sites in the world. Um, the first mortuary temple built here was actually during the 11th dynasty in the Middle Kingdom and was for Mentuhotep II. Um, that's the guy I mentioned in the last lecture who united Egypt. He was the great uniter, okay? But we don't care as much about his deal here as we do about Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut is, despite my inability to pronounce her name, is uh, my favorite figure from ancient Egypt. She's pretty rad. Uh, I will tell you why. <laughs> okay, so uh, she's super interesting. She was just kind of a very um, sneaky and had a lot of strategy and was a really uh, kind of um, very interesting historical figure. Okay, so she becomes regent, which is like a temporary placeholder ruler, after her father dies. So her father, Thutmose the I, was the pharaoh. He dies, but she decides that she doesn't want to just be regent. She wants to be the pharaoh. She wants to rule permanently. And so to continue to rule as pharaoh, she makes up her own origin story. She claims that her father, Tutmos I, who was a very renowned pharaoh, crowned her king before he died. Um, to fortify this fictive history, she commissions a relief mural depicting her being crowned king in front of all the gods. So her father crowning her and all the gods there as witnesses, and she has it put in her um, mortuary temple. The other thing is she's drawing this um, uh, unity, this, this connection between herself and the gods and goddesses by, by this invention of mortuary temples, right? And, and using this as a place of worship, but also where the king eventually will be buried. By the way, I know I keep saying king, even though she's a woman. She was quite insistent that she be portrayed as a king, as a pharaoh, not as a queen, because she felt that that would make her power more absolute and harder to deny. 
which is pretty interesting. She has herself portrayed in statuary with a beard even from time to time. It took historians and archaeologists a while to figure out that she was in fact a woman. Um, okay, so she has this relief mural commissioned um, showing her father crowning her king in front of all the gods as witnesses. It works. Uh, people believe it. They're like, okay, she's the pharaoh now. Hatshepsut is the first great female monarch whose name is recorded in history. She was not the first female pharaoh, actually, um, but she's, she's kind of the first really significant one who rules for a significant amount of time. Um, the first female pharaoh was Sobekneferu, uh, S-O-B-E-K-N-E-F-E-R-U, um, but she doesn't get to rule for very long. So Hatshepsut is, is the first, um, not the first pharaoh, but the first really significant uh, female monarch whose name is written down in history. She's often represented as a, a sphinx-like character where she has her head on the body of a lion. Um, she rules as pharaoh for 20 years, which is a pretty long lifespan, um, ruling span at this time period, um, particularly as someone who was only supposed to temporarily rule as regent and then kind of makes up her own mythology so she's able to stay. She later amends her mythology, her origin story, and claims that Thutmus the first, her dad, was actually her earthly stepfather, but her real dad was Amun-Ra, the sun god. So people are like, oh, wow, the sun god's daughter, yeah, she should definitely be the pharaoh. Um, so <laughs> she rules as the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty from 1479 to 1458, which is pretty uh, significant. Her architect, uh, Sinanmut, S-E-N-E-N-M-U-T, is uh, her, he's her ar architect at um, Deir al-Bari, and there, he did a really good job of incorporating um, her mortuary temple um, into the cliff here. So it has some like built-in support, so it's able to be built up quite large and expansive with all these terraces. You can see the people for scale here. So it's a huge, it's a huge thing. Um, and within this uh, complex, other than many, many statues of Hatshepsut and her father, uh, Thutmose the first, who's deified after his death, she also has shrines to Amon Re, her real dad, right? Uh, Hathor, Hathor, remember, is the mother goddess who's often portrayed as a cow, Anubis, the god of death, uh, and herself and Thutmose the first. So they're kind of portrayed in the same level, kind of on the same uh, level of worship as these other gods. Um, okay, so let's look. Here's just a couple um, more murals and sculptures more close up at the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut. So these are all portrayals of her. Again, she's portrayed as a man with a beard pretty often. And you'll notice the hat. We have the conical uh, with the, the other um, crown surrounding it, showing the, the unification, the reunification of Egypt. OK, so moving on from my favorite person. I don't want to talk about her forever. Uh, we have another ruler. Um, who is very famous. You may have actually heard of him, uh, Ramses II. So this is Abu Simbel, um, and this uh, we have two massive rock temples located here. Um, they're in Upper Egypt near the border with Sudan. So remember, Upper Egypt is in the south, right? So near the border with Sudan. We're going to talk about Sudan later because at this time it was the Kingdom of Kush. Okay, so this is near the border with Sudan and it's on the west bank of Lake Nasser, okay? It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's carved out of the mountainside, so a similar technique to what um, Hatshepsut's Mortuary Temple does where it's using the, um, the lay of the land to kind of support it. This is carved into the rock, so similar also to the Middle Kingdom um, rock cut tombs, but this is just on a much, much larger scale. Um, and so this is uh, created for Ramses II. Um, it's to serve as a monument to him and his queen. His queen's name is Nefertari. Um, and this is also to commemorate his victory at the Battle of Kadesh. It's built in 1264 BC, and uh, it's 
a, there's a great temple and a small temple. And before I get into all that, let me tell you a little bit more about Ramses II, because he's a pretty interesting character too. He rules, so Hatshepsut, remember, rules for 20 years. Ramses II rules for 60 years, three times as long. So that is very unusual in this time period. Um, that's a crazy long reign. It's from 1290 to 1224. Um, he's the last great warrior pharaoh, so he led his people in battle and directly went out and led them in battle himself. He was a great warrior. Um, at this uh, monument, we have four colossal images of himself. So all four of these figures are Ramses II. Um, and they're in the facade at the Great Temple. This is the bigger of the two temples, so it's called the Great Temple. These portraits are 65 feet tall each. You can see the people here for scale, like normal human adult people. You can also see Amon Re in the middle there with the sun disc with the cobra around it um, over his head. Um, also, the position of this is interesting because instead of facing east, as a lot of temples do, they face toward the kingdom of Kush. They face toward the border with Nubia. Uh, Nubia and kingdom of Kush are the same thing, by the way. We'll talk about that later. And they're supposed to intimidate Egypt's southern neighbor. This is interesting because it's not a celestial orientation. It's not oriented towards any feature in the sky, which is pretty unusual for, for Egyptian uh, works. So um, it's a little less refined than some of the earlier sculpture. We have this immense rock cut interior. I think I have a, yeah, there's an image of the interior. More massive sculptures. You'll notice in the sculptures the proportions are kind of off, the heads are a little big, um, it, it, and they, they're they stiff, but they don't have um, quite the polish from things that, from statuary that we saw in the Old Kingdom, for example. Um, they're also, they don't have that soft kind of natural look about them that's more realistic like the Middle Kingdom. So they're kind of these exaggerated figures that um, are, are not quite as, um, polished and not quite as uh, accurate in terms of proportion. Um, okay, so he ha also has a temple made to honor his principal wife as well, with giant statues of both of them, two each. Um, and then there's this massive underground tomb system at the Valley of the Kings in Thebes, which is discovered actually by an American team in 1987. So during my lifetime. <laughs> so. Um, that's uh, pretty cool. So all of these these uh, temples have these massive underground kind of tunnels and um, things are still being discovered every day. Okay, let's look at a couple more things. This is Karnak. So this is Karnak, Egypt. Um, basically successive kings in uh, the New Kingdom would add on to important temples of the gods. Um, particularly Amun-Ra at Karnak is, is an example of this. So this starts in the Middle Kingdom, but it's largely added on by Thutmose I and III, Hatshepsut, and Ramses II. Other pharaohs add on to it as late as the 4th century BCE, so it's kind of a continuing project that people are always adding to. Um, this is similar to other New Kingdom temples. It's axial, meaning um, it's arranged long ways on an axis, which you can kind of see from this overhead shot. Um, it's a pylon temple, so there's massive gateways, um, i.e. pylons, right, with sloping walls, and the walls slope as a support system, as a structural support. That's where they slope upwards, which they figured that out pretty early on in the pre-dynastic mastabas, and then they've continued to use that um, as they uh, continue to scale up their buildings. This whole thing, um, we have a 58,000 square foot hypostyle hall um, which basically means um, a, a, the roof is resting on columns. It's all supported by columns. Um, let's see, I think I have some more pictures. Here we go. Here's the hypostyle hall. Uh, here we have some of the statuary inside. Here we go, that's a good one. Uh, so, uh, and there's the word hypostyle. That's the kind of word that you might wanna remember because that's the kind of thing I put on quizzes. Um, okay, so we have um, a clear story at the top, which means lots of fenestration, lots of windows, so light can come in. We have 134 massive columns. Look at the size of these things. Those are adult humans next to it. Look how gigantic that is. 
Um, the 12 central columns are 75 feet high. I mean, this is just a massive scale building here. The capitals are 22 feet in diameter. That means across. Uh, so 100 people could stand on the top of one of these things really easily. The center columns are taller than the sides, which creates this kind of clear story of windows to illuminate, to, to let light in. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, no, that's in the discussion now. Okay, sorry, there's another slide that I thought was here, but it's an assignment for your discussion. Okay, so uh, this is the tomb of Nebamon, and it's uh, in Thebes. So this is a very well-preserved mural, and I like to show this so you have an idea of color. Look at how colorful this is. Now, if you look at these columns and everything we've looked at so far, you can see all the giant hieroglyphics carved into here. This would have been fully painted also. So it's been out in the desert, so it's been worn away, but all of these things, Egypt was not this like beige colored thing. Everything was very brightly painted like this everywhere. This is just very well-preserved. Okay, so um, fresco seco, which means it's painted uh, on the wall, uh, dry, not bound into the material the wall is made of. Nebamon has um, a, two titles, two job titles. He was a scribe and a counter of grain. So he was kind of like a, um, a scribe, a record keeper for the pharaoh, and he was also sort of an accountant, I think. Um, he was very wealthy. He uh, has this commemorative funeral ceremony with a feast and music and dancing, which is um, portrayed in one of the other murals in his tomb. So he had a very luxurious life. Um, this particular depiction of him is him um, out fishing. So he's standing on this um, papyrus raft that they used to fish the Nile with. And then he has his trained birds that would help him fish. So you could have a uh, waterfowl, you tie a thing around their neck so that they couldn't swallow and they'd go get fish and bring it, be trained to come back to you and they couldn't swallow the fish so then you take it from them. Um, they'd also hunt with falcons and things. These were things done at this time. So you can see him out enjoying his hunt. But again, I like to show you this so that you can see all the wonderful color that would have been Kind of everywhere. This, like a lot of Egyptian artifacts, uh, is now in the British Museum. The, the fun uh, joke I saw on the internet the other day was, why are the Great Pyramids still in Egypt? Because they were too big to move to the British Museum. <laughs> okay, um, so next time we will talk about Akhenaten and the Amarna period.